Welcome to the Dr. Geo Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Geo, where it is my full intention to help you with your prostate health and how to live better with age. We have our guy. We have our guy. You should know everything about him, Steve Cianti. Steve, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Well, Gio, um, I'm honored to be on the podcast. We go back a lot of years, our years <laughs> together do. in New York. That's right. Uh, in which, uh, you know, people thought uh, what we were doing was really out there. And, you know, it's interesting. Which it today, was, and, to some yeah, degree. Was, but, you know, the world is changing. And yeah. uh, now I think people think we might be kind of smart guys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead and, and, and expand on that. Why were we the crazy ones back in, what, 20, 2009? Uh, so you were uh, – you were faculty at NYU. I'm still at NYU. Uh, you were faculty at NYU, and we were doing different things. We were. I was focused on integrative uh, methods, uh, lifestyle methods, things that had little science. There was a good amount of science to support it, but you know, not as much as, as there is today. Now we're no longer the crazy ones. Now everyone wants to know what we're doing. And then you were doing some crazy stuff called focal therapy and haifu and all these things. And I would consider you, you know, one of the pioneers in terms of, in terms of doing um, multiple focal therapies and kind of figuring out what kind of focal therapy can um, individualizing the approach, what's the right focal therapy for the different type of prostate cancer. I think in my mind, you were the pioneer and kind of bringing it all together or the different modalities. So Take us back. Why were we the crazy ones in 20, 2009 and, 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 and what, what was happening back then? Well, you know, back in the days when um, I was in my training uh, as a urologist, the dogma uh, was that, you know, all cancer cells were bad mm -hmm. anywhere in the body, but especially in the prostate. And then, of course, men, if they had prostate cancer, were going to die of their prostate cancer. Period. End of that, story. That's it. That's what, we, that's what I was taught in the 1980s as a young resident uh, learning how to be a, you know, a urologist. And, and so our therapies historically over literally um, 75 to 100 years were all aimed at either radically remove the entire prostate or when radiation really became invented, you know, of age in the 1950s and 60s, mm. of course, direct radiation in the prostate. Now, those therapies were radical and they were aimed at the entire prostate and all the surrounding organs. And in those days, the the paternalistic attitude I think a lot of us had or a lot of our, our, our mentors had in those days were, you know, we'd say to men, oh, don't worry, at least we're saving your life, you mm. know. And, you know, hey, if you're a little wet, that's fine, you know, and if, you know. If you can't have an erection anymore that you know there's you have penile prosthesis that'll fix everything up steve but, back in the day it wasn't a little wet no it was very wet <laughs> oh the guys were in diapers they, they, they were, were absolutely yeah absolutely. and their diapers were were soaked it was uh, a travesty each, each, yeah exactly yeah. no it was a travesty and you know, i realized in my first 10 years as a urologic surgeon all i did was take prostates out in the 90s mm. but you know towards the late 90s i began to realize that you know, how does one do a technically perfect operation, a beautiful procedure? You look at that and say, oh, my God, that's a work of art. It is artistic. And, and, I have to say, and, and, as a non-surgeon, I've, I've watched and I've been in the OR. I'm like, my goodness, that is that is a piece of art. There's no question about that. But then you look at that poor man. He's three months, six months out, and he's still in a depends. He's still mm -hmm. in a diaper and say, how does something go so wrong? And it's not it, it's, I realize that it's not me. It's not, it's not a thousand procedures. It sounds like you're in a relationship, procedures. Steve. It's not, it's not, it's not you. It's me. <laughs> <Yeah, right. laughs> That's why we need to break. You know, we need to break up. It's not you. It's me. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but you know, you realize there's limitations, right? There's big limitations to our operation. We, we just can't, we just can't get. You know, we just can't get to that point where we can tell a man with confidence, you're going to be dry and you're going to be potent. Now, and in so, the defense of the problem, in the defense of surgeons in this day and age, I have to say, we're, with the guys that better. I see, my goodness, it is. I have to say, I don't remember the last time I seen a patient that's uh, after a prostatectomy who's wet. Um, I, I can't remember the last time. And of course, is we have to redefine what wetness is because if you know they do have a drop here or two, but man, they they've really mastered that procedure. Yeah. No, no question. Of course, you're in an area where you've got the world's experts at your institution as yeah. well. 
Yeah, and I even mean, so nearby, I have to say, uh, is yeah, Sloan yeah, no, and, and, and you oh, know, that's you, right. Yeah, I no, have to yeah, say. And so, yeah, you're, you're in New York City. I mean, you've got the you've got some of the masters of the universe, so to speak, uh, in your area. Yeah. And so but realize that it, that's not universal. Right. <laughs> that's true. You know, and, I am so, in a bubble and I think that everything is New York City sometimes. And I yeah. realize that when people come from the Midwest somewhere to see me and they try to or, have me help them with the urinary incontinence or with the erectile dysfunction post prostatectomy. I'm like, wow, that was that was very badly done. So it's true. Not not all uh, areas or surgeons are created equal. That's for sure. But you know, in 2002, um, a colleague of mine, um, his name is Gary Onick, and I'll give Gary credit because back Gary in the early Onick, days, I, I, I have a yeah. he. You know, uh, a couple of years ago, I was talking to Aaron Katz, and Gary Onick comes, and to me, that's like a celebrity. This is yeah. cryo is. Right. Associated with Gary no Onick. So go ahead and talk about Gary uh, Onick a little bit. So G Gary and I, you know, met each other uh, in early, early 2000s, maybe 2000, 2001. And Gary uh, had the audacity to suggest that we could freeze half the prostate. And he did a series of patients and wrote a book about this and published his data showing that uh, even at five years out, their cancer free rates were equal to everything else we were doing. But he was showing that 90 to 95 percent of men had unchanged erections and he had zero pads, zero incontinence in that series. Now, to get to that point in those days, we didn't have MRI. Right. Mm -hmm. So what we had to do is we had to do these very detailed biopsies. We did a thing called a saturation biopsy, in which we take 60, 80, 90 biopsies of somebody Oof. and we'd map the prostate That's out. That's a prostatectomy, those, Steve. Oh, it was a needle prostatectomy. <laughs> and and one of our colleagues, Dr. Winston Barzell, um, mm. you know, pioneered that. Uh, but in those days, that's the only way to really assess the prostate to know the cancer was truly in a region, truly only in one side. Mm. That was the early days. But it really caught my imagination because I realized that for men that really had unilateral one-sided cancer, if we can prove that, we could treat just the cancerous side of the prostate. Now, in those days, that was heresy. That was craziness. Mm. You mean you left the other side? How about if it gets cancer in the next five or ten years? Right. Okay, well, we'll, we'll treat it then. What's the big deal? You know, uh, but, but <laughs> the point is our guys were doing great. Yeah. yeah. Now, so now technology. So did you along. participate back in the early 2000s yeah. doing oh, yeah. uh, focal cryotherapy? And cryotherapy is freezing, That's right, right? Freezing uh, part of the, uh, of the yeah. prostate. No, in those days, we didn't have MRI, right? No, we didn't have genetics, genomics. We didn't have any of the advanced techniques that we talk about yeah. all the time. We just did these massive saturation mapping biopsies. If the cancer was just on one side, we'd treat just one half the prostate. In those days, all we had was freezing. We'd do a hemi or a half cryotherapy. The guys did great. I, st I did my first one of those in 2002, mm -hmm. 21 years ago. Now, people thought we were absolutely nuts because the dogma that the, the the pervasive thinking of the day is that cancer is always, always throughout the entire prostate and any cancer cell left behind is going to be bad, really bad, you know, and we, that's what we, we, that's, we know it, it, even it, most recently with the protect trial showing, right. Uh, right, was, right. Showing, uh, uh, I, I think much of our audience, I, I'll put up a, a little, uh, link to that paper for those that want to geek out on it. I don't want to expand on it, but it, it showed that three arms, one group, 500 people, so it's not, you know, small number, uh, small sample size. One group, radiation therapy. The other group, uh, a radical prostatectomy. The other group, active surveillance. No difference after, what, 20, 25 years? It was 15 years prospective, as yeah. a report in the New England Journal of Medicine. No difference in survival. So <laughs> even to this day, with that trial, we can't really prove that if we do an invasive therapy, we can't really prove any therapy prolongs a man's life. Now, in truth, there are subsets of men where I think we do make a difference. That's right. So we don't, we don't want to be totally nihilistic about this. That's right. Well, that's what? Can you, you exp I think that's a good point because we yeah. will sound, <laughs> if, if if we're not careful, like prostatectomies don't, don't make a difference, radiation doesn't make a difference and all these things. That's not what we're trying to say. It's what's the right approach for the right patient with the right, right. Uh, with, with, with a certain type of a prostate cancer, a certain stage, right? So it's individualizing the treatment. Right. So, you know, as technology came along now, inter MRI begins to get uh, traction in Europe and certainly in the U.S. by the late 2000s. Uh, and certainly a lot of this work was pioneered by the folks at NYU in 2008 and 2009, a lot of work was being done at places like the NIH, mm -hmm. uh, NYU, uh, UCSF, 
prominent institutions really showing the role mm. of MRI to show where the tumor was in the prostate. And that led to, once you knew where the tumor mm. was, then we can do a biopsy targeting the biopsy to where the tumor actually is instead of randomly putting a bunch of needles yeah. in to go on this hunting expedition to see what we might or might not find. Right. And so technology was getting better. And with MRI and targeted biopsy, now the ability to know where the tumor uh, lived in the prostate was finally coming of age around 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. And that was really the serious beginnings of focal therapy in the United States. The ability to localize the cancer uh, was important. We then began to understand that not all cancers are created equal. Yeah. So we began to understand that these little cancer cells that we call Gleason 6 cancer cells, 3 plus 3 equals sixes, if they're small, if they're only sixes, Work was coming out of Johns Hopkins at that time mm. that showed that you can watch these men. Now, remember, Hopkins, the hallmark of radical prostatectomy, <laughs> yeah. made famous by Dr. Patrick Walsh. Well, we he must take every prostate out, right? That, landmark, that... <laughs> landmark surgeon, right? Now, let's take it back a little. I'm a little bit of a, history, a history buff. Hugh Young, right? Oh, 19... Hugh Hampton, 1904. 1904. 1904. First prostatectomy. Right. Ever. That's right. right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, so, that happens, yeah. But, you know, in the same out of the institution comes landmark research showing that men who had only a small amount of Gleason grade six cancer over 10 years had no increased risk of dying. In fact, in that group of men, zero episodes of spread or metastasis. And so it's taken 10 years since that time for us to get that into our heads. But I think it's now a standard today mm. that small amounts of Gleason grade six cancer have virtually no risk to a patient, and we probably shouldn't even be calling them cancers. That's a great point. So uh, Scott Egner, I uh, was hanging out with him uh, during the day. He's, he's very vocal about that uh, on Twitter and so forth. So yeah. you believe, so you're, you're on the side of should we even call a Gleason six cancer cancer? You, you yeah, think and I, we... would, I, I would I would qualify that, and I would say one that has genetically no significant mutational change. Mm. So low genomic risk Gleason six has virtually virtually no cancer potential. Beautiful. And I, and I think yeah. and I think that's I think that's true today, and I think there's a lot of evidence that would support that. But those trials from Hopkins mm. on surveillance. Same trials done out of Toronto with Dr. Laurie Klotz, mm. all pointed to the same conclusions. Mm. So now we know that in we now have learned that in many prostate cancers, you've got what's called an index lesion, mm. right? You've got an area where the tumor is well seen on MRI. It contains a significant Gleason score, whether it's a seven, three plus four, a four plus three, or even a four plus four. But the remainder of the prostate has nothing or tiny little sites of six, mm. right? We now know that what's going to drive that man's future cancer risk is not the little bits of six. It's that index tumor. It's that MRI visible tumor that's findable, diagnosable, characterizable, mm. and targetable. Mm. And so that, that technology, you know, we had this idea about focal therapy, but the technology wasn't there yet now today with mri with targeted biopsy with genetic characterization of tumor and i think we're still at the beginning of that but we now have the ability to personalize a man's cancer diagnosis and mm. and understand in 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 leo the cancer patient right Mr. Leo, what do you have as a patient, right? Mm. Where's your cancer? How big is it? What's the Gleason score? What's your tumor near? And if all you've got is one primary region, if we can treat that region, guess what? You're going to be as functionally close to normal as possible. Mm. And so prostate cancer for you will be a speed bump and not a car collision. Mm. It'll mm. be a speed bump. It'll be something we'll take care of will monitor you and you're going to go on with your life and have a pretty darn normal life. That's the premise of focal therapy. And, I and, saw and, that 20 years ago, but we didn't have the technology there. So they right. said we were crazy. But now the world's <laughs> saying, my God, you guys are starting to figure this out. This is what Steve Jobs said. Here, here's for all the crazy ones. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, you know. And, and I'll, let me add to that, because um, this is an area that I'm uh, as passionate as you, I don't know if there's any if anybody's as passionate as you are, Steve. I, 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 I'm trying to I'm trying to make it up there. Um, 
you have this localized tumor that we call prostate cancer. It's whatever Gleason score it is. You treat it focally. Here's the other thing. That man is ready to make radical changes to his lifestyle. Oh, absolutely. Right? That diagnosis. He's a motivated guy. That got his detention, right? That, that because let's be real. I say this all the time. We, men don't do things to prevent. Men don't do lifestyle changes for health. Health is an ambiguous term that means nothing. Men make changes only <laughs> when their life is on the line. And that diagnosis, they see the fear of God, and they're saying, I'm ready, whatever, whatever it is that I need yeah. to do. Yeah, I, I don't know. They have to get hit upside the head by two by four to get the message, right? It's unbelievable, but that's how, that's how we, we, we care about performance, Steve, if we're honest, more so than health. Until sure. the point, you know, up to the point where we're faced with our mortality. Steve, you mentioned focal therapies. Let's stay there. What's a focal therapy? And what are the types of focal therapies out there that exist for prostate cancer? Okay, so focal therapy is a concept, right? Mm -hmm. It's a concept that we can put some type of directed energy guided by imaging into a portion of the prostate. That's what that term means, mm -hmm. right? So that's pretty general, right? Um, Imaging today can be by ultrasound, it can be by MRI, and more commonly by MRI and ultrasound combination, or what's called MRI fusion. Mm. So, so, so the treat once, the treat is the treatment only as good as the imaging. Well, imaging is critical, right? And and so a diagnostics is critical. Yeah. I'm only you know I'm all, I'm I'm a really good shot, but if I can't see my target. I'm not a very mm. good shot. Mm. So, you know, we, we have to know where the target is, right, sure. in the prostate. And that's that's imaging based. OK. And the better our imaging, the more precise we can be. Right. Where are we with, with our, our imaging these days? Is, is how in a scale of one to 10, 10 being perfect. I don't know if we'll ever reach it. Where are we with our imaging today versus what's in the pipeline, you think? I think we're probably around seven and a half to eight. Wow. OK. That's actually yeah, and, pretty and, and, darn and, good. And, and, and it, it is, and I think that's 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 assuming that uh, that the urologist or the the, the, the surgeon has uh, good access to good imaging in their in their in their academic or community center, mm. right? Uh, but but where we're going to go in the future is going to get even better. Wow, ten and out so, of ten. Oh, I think we're going to get there, and I'll tell you, there's two things that I think are going to help. I'm really a big believer that AI is going to help. Whoa. Whoa, okay. I can that, see I'll, that. Go on, I'll, I'll go on a limb because I will, will tell you that MRI has the ability when properly done to differentiate in, in nine to nine and a half out of 10 cases, the characteristics of cancer versus non-cancer. But as humans, um, our skills are different and limited. Right? And, and some people are really good at it. And so, I mean, you know, in, in NYU, you get really spoiled. <laughs> you got you got one of the, you got some of the top MRI guys in the country there, and I, I've worked with them. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's but, true. But when you leave the bubble of the experts <laughs> and you go to anywhere, yeah. then the skills are hit and miss, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, as a technology, MRI has the ability to discern significant cancers nine and a half out of ten times. Mm. But we we don't perform that well because of the human factor. Mm. So, if we can train a computer to recognize normal versus abnormal, mm -hmm. right? Which is really what AI is. And Even are... break it down, Steve, you think in the future? So it will tell you, yep, that's at least in seven, three plus four. Absolutely. Yep, that's and, at least in nine. And the, the information is there. It's buried in those images. It's in the buried in the different degrees of blood flow and diffusion characteristics. So the raw information is there, but we're limited by as humans what we can see with our eyes and yeah. and what we sometimes our biases and what we see and what we miss. Yeah. So AI will level the playing field. Mm. Okay, but what's even more exciting is different what are called biologic or functional markers. Hmm. And today, um, the, a good example of that would be a PSMA PET imaging. Hmm. So a PSMA, for anyone who doesn't know, prostate is specific membrane antigen. Mm -hmm. PSMA is a basically a drug put into the body mm -hmm. that's got a, uh, a seek and, and find mission mm -hmm. where any prostate cancer cells anywhere there in the body or in the prostate, this chemical will lock onto those cancer cells. And it's got a little glow particle, a radioactive tracer particle attached to it, which, which basically will send a little signal to a camera and doing it what's called a PET CT scan, tell us 
where those cancer cells are. Mm -hmm. But it's helpful in the prostate as well mm -hmm. to help localize tumor. Now, as that technology continues to improve, and again, AI will be used there as well. Mm -hmm. So it, more types of functional imaging that look more in terms of how cells interact, uh, how, uh, how antibodies attach to cancer characteristics on the cells, it's going to improve our ability to get even better. So I think we're around seven and a half. I think we can be at nine and a half. Ooh, I think, I geez. think, you know, technology is going to get us there and I don't think it's that far away. Wow. That's I, a huge I don't statement. think that's that far. Away. I think we're starting to see AI coming into radiology today. Hmm. I think in the next one to two years, we're going to see it really explode. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Focal therapies for prostate cancer. Let's go back to that. So you have this, you, you, you can focalize as a, the term implies the treatment for prostate. Now you could keep your prostate. You don't have to take the whole gland out and you can target the whole, um, the, the, the tumor itself. So let's, um, let's talk about what are the different types of th focal therapies that exist for prostate cancer. And with each one, how, how targeted is it? In other words, are you hitting just a tumor? Are you hitting a couple centimeters outside of it? How far out do you need to go with yeah. each technology? Well, I think I think we some of the work that was done um, 10 years ago. And again, I'll go back to, you know, the folks that I'm familiar with. Um, some of this work did come out of NYU mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was work that uh, that suggested that the um, area of abnormal cancer extended um, a little bigger than what the MRI dark spot was. OK, mm -hmm. so the MRI mm -hmm. shows a target. We know that we have to put a what's called a safety margin around that. Uh, that that MRI lesion to make sure we're encompassing the entire tumor. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a aim at the dark spot on the MRI. Mm -hmm. It's the it's the abnormal spot with the safety margin. How right? how, how, that, how long is the safety margin? Yeah, and the work the the work has really uh, has really set that up so that most research suggests today we're zeroing in on eight to ten millimeters of margin where we can take it. Now, mm -hmm. if you got a big prostate, there's a lot of real estate there. It's mm -hmm. easy to get a margin. Mm -hmm. It's a little harder in a smaller prostate. Interesting. So not, most people want space. a small prostate, right? Uh, <laughs> but if you have a small prostate with prostate cancer, it, it, there's not a lot of real estate there. So you oh, don't have I, a lot of margin. I, I, I think a big prostate's a lot easier because there's a lot of space. Now, of how, so if the tumor, so, so clearly what that means to me is that there's some areas where you may not want to do focal therapy because it might That's be right. too close to the bladder or too close to the colon, That's right. right? That's right. And so, and so as much as I sound like an anti-prostatectomy guy, <laughs> I saw a patient this week yeah. who had a tumor right against the urethra out by the sphincter. Mm. There's no margin. There's no way to treat that without totally destroying or mm. cooking the urethra or a sphincter. And that's the one patient... You know, that's the one patient clearly in my mind that a a skilled robotic surgeon is going to do a better job for mm, that patient. Interesting. And so it's it's this is not about, you know, one white way to do anything. It's about understanding there's a lot of men. I would say as many as 60 to 70 percent of men who have a cancer that is regional that can be treated regionally. And now mm -hmm. you ask the question, how do we do that? There's a lot of different energy sources. And there's no real data that one is really better than the other. Mm -hmm. It has to do with, I think, three things. Number mm -hmm. one, tumor location. Understanding three-dimensionally where the tumor lives in the prostate, there'll be some technologies where it's easier to get energy to that target than others. Mm -hmm. The second depends on availability, right? In any community, one doctor is not going to have expertise at all at five or six different treatments they'll be good at one or two and hopefully maybe three or four mm. okay so it depends on what's available and thirdly then the logistics will come down to uh questions like insurance some procedures we're starting to see insurance coverage on mm. others there's they're still far away from insurance coverage so those are practicality aspects let's break it but, down steve which which are the which are those those uh focal type of treatments with that are what are their names and what kind of energy yeah. sources and yeah and if there's one better than the other, which I don't know if that's the case. Yeah, so so the granddaddy, right? <laughs> the premier, the granddaddy is cryotherapy or freezing. Mm -hmm. 1960s, it was used in the United States, fallen to disfavor, really reintroduced in the 1990s. Our friend Gary Onick wrote the landmark work in early 2000s on treating half the prostate with cryotherapy. That's our workhorse. Now, what's modernized mm -hmm. that today, mm -hmm. in those days, we had ultrasound. Today, mm -hmm. 
when I do a cryo therapy, I'm using MRI guidance. I'm using an MRI platform. Mm. MRI platform mirrors the MRI to the ultrasound, and now I can target precisely with with freezing a tumor region. So in an end, I did I did one of these this morning. I had a patient with an anterior prostate, 60 year old man, tumor at the top of the prostate, mm. far away from the rectum, putting two cryo needles under that tumor with an MRI roadmap took me an hour. This guy will do beautifully. He will maintain all his erectile function because we're not near his nerves. Mm. He's going to retain orgasmic function. He's going to have normal ejaculation. He'll have no incontinence. Will he have normal ejaculation, even though part of his prostate uh, will be destroyed? He'll have a little less volume, but who's measuring? You know? (laughs) Steve. Come on. You know some of the guys? Maybe some of these guys, guys, Steve. You've seen them. Some of the guys. They're me- some guys are measuring out there. I'm just saying, but, you know, <laughs> but, but he will have a normal sense of orgasm, really. Right. And so and so him, an MRI guided, targeted cryotherapy because of his tumor location was beautiful. Yeah. Now, that's our workhorse. That's been around a long time. Now, here's the nice thing about that let, is let's let's put a, a, a pause there for a second. Focal cryotherapy, whole different ballgame. Oh, it is. If it's full whole gland cryotherapy. Yeah. Right. Whole different whole, ball gleam. Right. If I got to freeze the whole prostate, it's hard to control the ice. There is a lot of ED that goes with that. Yeah. But the minute we can target a region and have MRI to guide us to a precise MRI roadmap guided treatment, yeah. that's a different, that's not our grandfather's cryotherapy. That's not what I learned 25 years ago. What happens this to is, that frozen the, gland? How does it dis- disintegrate? Does the, how does the body, what the body consumes it? What happens to that damaged <laughs> Gland. Well, it, does, it doesn't really matter what the energy is. The body deals with it the same way. It's mm. all called thermal ablation or temperature extreme ablation. Whether you make the tumor hot or cold, mm. the body doesn't care. Mm. It, it, there's, a, there's an auto uh, a digestive process where the body internally sort of degrades, digests, uh, gets rid of that, um, that, that thermally treated tumor and mm. replaces it with a scar. Okay. So it's a, yeah. So it's not like there's a hole there on that part of the prostate. No. It's, it's scar tissue becomes a scar it fills in right okay. and so and the old guys will know remember the old days we used to fix our cars with bondo right remember that <laughs> right funny. well this is like putting bondo in the, in the ablative area right? It, right it fills it in with this filling tissue right right okay so, uh, that's how good, i think about good it. analogy <laughs> so so that's cryo that's the workhorse now you know in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s hyphu began to be developed uh in the united states out of indiana university and in europe primarily in Paris and in France and Germany. What's HIFU? Break that down for Hi, us a little so bit. So HIFU is high intensity focused ultrasound, right? Mm-hmm. That's an ultrasound probe in the rectum that, that puts focused sound energy to a very tight concentration or focal zone wherever we aim it in the prostate. So the sound waves come together, they create heat. Mm-hmm. So instead of cold with cryo, HIFU or ultrasound creates heat. Mm-hmm. Right. So, again, the body doesn't care whether it's hot or cold. It's right. temperature extreme that kills the tissue. So same type so, of ultrasound pregnant women use to watch their I, look at their baby in a monitor. This is the same type of ultrasound, except more probably it, more intense, except that it's it's more in, it's 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 higher energy and it's focused. Mm. The sound waves converge and where the sound waves converge, they create heat. Mm-hmm. Now, that's done again with MRI guidance as well. Mm-hmm. So. The tumors that are close to where the sound waves come from, that is the bottom part of the prostate, are perfect for HIFU because it's close to where the energy comes from. The farther sound waves have to travel, the more power they lose. Mm. So tumors that are close to the bottom part or posterior part or rectal side of the prostate are perfect for HIFU because the distance is really, really short. Mm. And the so those peripheral tumors that are close to the rectum, where you would put a probe in the rectum and the energy comes from that probe, and those tumors, it, I mean, peripheral um, tumors in the prostate, that's about 80% of tumors, isn't it, for yeah, prostate? But we more see, less 70, yeah, but we, yeah, but, yeah, but we see more and more anterior tumors mm. now that we're doing MRI imaging. So, But you're right, probably three quarters of them are posterior. Posterior, yeah, right. that's right, yeah. Matt, yeah. But but so HIFU becomes a nice procedure. Now, certain things may make someone a good or not a good candidate. If there's stones or calcium deposits that can block the sound energy. Mm-hmm. And so that's another case where I may go back to use cryotherapy because that's not dependent on stones or calcifications. So again, HIFU has become really the ultrasound workhorse 
technique we use. So we have cryotherapy, we have a high fuel or high intensity focus out on those two are our workhorses. Now the new kid on the block. It sounds like is, let me because I'm going to segue into the new kid on the block. No. Yeah. It's so, so here we are post uh, uh, posterior tumors easy to get to anterior not so easy. Well, maybe that's something we can target with some other technology where we have more access through I don't know the urethra and the right. penis is, and then we could hit some of those areas in the anterior side. Is there anything out there like that? Yeah. Well, you know, and exactly that brings us into <laughs> Tulsa, right? Tulsa. Transurethral, transurethral ultrasound ablation. Really cool stuff. I mean, now we're in an MRI suite, real time, real time temperature monitoring of the prostate tissue as we treat. The MRI has the a capability to measure pro tissue temperatures. Uh, it's called MRI thermometry. Mm. So it's like putting little thermostats in the prostate, but the MRI technology can measure prostate tissue without putting needles in, right? Mm. So as energy is placed from the center of the prostate, the urethra, outwards, it's like the spokes in a wheel coming from the center outward. That is a great technique for an enlarged prostate, mm. especially with an anterior location. Because remember, if we're trying to treat uh, uh, prostate cancer from the bottom up with HIFU, if the prostate's too tall or too big, we can't do it. Mm. It's too far for the sound waves to go. But right. if the sound waves come from the center of the prostate on out, th then we can get a much larger prostate treated and we can treat tumors that live in the top part of the prostate non-invasively. So Tulsa is an MRI monitored robotically controlled procedure mm. in which an ultrasound probe is placed in the penis. Now, guys, you're asleep, totally asleep, <laughs> right? All right, totally asleep. All right. That probe in the penis is cooled to help protect the urethra. Mm. Okay. But the sound energy comes from the center on out and it's the contours of the prostate are precisely drawn based on the MRI pictures. The energy delivered is precisely controlled by the temperatures we achieve as measured by MRI. So that's the really the most high tech and newest approach. And it's it's been around for around for four to five years now. It's not quite stood the test of time yet, but the, the initial data looks to be very similar to everything else we're doing. And we can treat as much or as little of the prostate as possible or as necessary, right? You can do a focal procedure. Mm. Sometimes you've got, I've got guys who have these huge prostates and a little bit of cancer. Well, the little bit of cancer is not something we might watch, but they're miserable because of their very large prostate. Mm. Tulsa is a perfect solution because I can treat both conditions. You get a right? twofer. You get a twofer. That's right. And so, you know, it's, it's nice because it's another tool. It's mm -hmm. another tool that, the, that the, the prostate focal therapist needs to have. Those are the three. Now, there's a couple other ones we can mention, just a list. I mean, there's something called um, a nano knife or electroporation. Yeah. And that's, ne that's needles placed into the prostate where an electric current is passed. And for certain tumors, that's very effective. Now, there's not a lot of people who really are skilled at it yet in the United States. Yeah. But, but it's still an intriguing tool. And I think we'll see more of that. Where, right. um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know anyone who's doing, nor the institutions that are doing nano knife. What, what, what's the process, what technology or what energies use there, Steve? It's electricity. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's direct current. And it's, it's directed direct, from where to where? Where's a, it's, it, there's, it, so a couple of needles are placed in an array. Four needles are placed into the prostate hmm. and the needles are connected to a, basically to an electrosurgical generator a battery, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so electric current is placed into each needle and they're mm -hmm. placed in such a configuration that the, the energy travels from one needle to another. And as it goes from one needle to another, it breaks holes in the cell membranes mm -hmm. or creates pores in the cells, mm -hmm. hence the name electroporation. Mm -hmm. And when you create holes in cells, the cells die. Mm -hmm. It, one of its advantages is that it doesn't really destroy normal structures. Its disadvantage is not readily available, and there's very little use of it yet in the U.S. Mm. Uh, I think we'll see more of that as time goes on. But that's an intriguing uh, approach. Where are the needles coming through? Is it uh, through the, the perineum. perineal it's like, area? It's, yeah, yeah, it's like cryo. The needles yeah. are coming through the perineum, like brachytherapy, like yeah. a seed implant, that's or right. like a cryotherapy. So it's transperineal needle placement. All right. Then you, so then you have focal laser ablation. Mm -hmm. Right. So FLA, if you can, yeah. Tell me more now, about that. So if you can put a needle through the perineum and do it in an, in an MRI suite, uh, a laser creates a small zone of destruction. 
and if it's MRI, if you have a small lesion, you can put a, a a a laser fiber through the center of the lesion. You can create a zone of destruction around the lesion. Now, F, FLA can be very effective in highly skilled hands, and that's mm. the and that's true of everything. But I think it's especially true of FLA. There's very few people in the United States today. Are there more than any, two? Uh, very few. I mean, there's probably four. <laughs> there's four, probably yeah, four, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, it's it, it's in the right and the people who are truly masters for small lesions, it's effective. Hmm. Uh, what I like about Haifu and Cryo and Tulsa is if I got to treat a little bigger area to get safety margin, I can do it very easily and reliably without putting, uh, you know, in, in a very minimally invasive way. So I think those techniques are a bit more flexible. But FLA is real, and for the right patient, I think is a very, very nice result. Steve, I, you were, I mean, listen, we do go back since 29, uh, 2009, and man, you geeked out on all those focal <laughs> therapies because you were there working with Sperling with FLA man and you were there yeah. learning it and you were there doing it as well <laughs> I yeah. mean you really went all in I, when I think Steve Cianti I think focal therapies period end of story yeah. for, for prostate cancer no no you know I've always thought it's important if you're going to be in this field you got to have all the tools because mm. you know you don't want to make you don't want to ever fit a square peg into a round hole. Yeah. Right. You don't want to say, okay, you know, Mr. Patient, this is what I do. Therefore, this is what I'm going to offer you. You want, if it's, if, if a focal therapy approach is appropriate, mm. right, then you want to say, okay, what's the best tool to accomplish this? This is like a craftsman, right? Yeah. You get a, you get a fine, you get a skilled carpenter over and build some at your house. And you can tell when that person is a skilled carpenter. Right. Yeah, they, sure. can, they can create things that you and I don't know, never know how to create because we don't do that kind of work. Hmm. But they're, they have exactly the right tools. And that's what we do. Right. We have to be able to look at a situation, see it in our brain three dimensionally. Where's the tumor? How am I going to get energy out of that tumor? What's the best way to kill the target and not hurt other things? That's hmm. what it comes down to. It's not that complicated. But that's you right. got to have more tools than one to do that. Steve, if I had if I'm listening and I have prostate cancer. I would say I'm sold. And we know in medicine, if it sounds too good to be true, it, it probably is. So let's talk about some of the side effects for these technologies, okay. right? Because they do have some of them sometimes do come with side effects. I mean, you're saying, hey, just do focal th uh, cryo or just do haifu or just do Tulsa. You keep your sexuality, no incontinence, no anything. You're going to be cancer free. Where do I sign up? Yeah. So no, what are the side effects? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing we do in medicine that's 100% with anybody, right? It doesn't exist. Yeah. If someone says everyone's got perforate erections and they've never had a drop of urine, then that's probably not true, right? That doesn't exist, right? Um, a lot of it depends on, you know, tumor location, how aggressive a treatment someone needs, right? Mm. And everyone's different. But, you know, obviously, for most of these treatments, someone's going to need a catheter for a couple of days anyway, and maybe even maybe even up to a week. Mm -hmm. So no one wants, no man wants to hear they've got a catheter in their penis, mm -hmm. right? But so that that's uncomfortable, right? And so do there bleed in the urine uh, uh, days later, weeks later, years later? Do they find blood no, in the no, urine? Not, not not really. The first week or two, there may be a little rosé tinge to the mm -hmm. urine, mm -hmm. slight, but significant bleeding really is rare. Really, really, I remember rare. early days at Haifu. Yeah. Man, the well, strictures were serious where guys well, we, yeah, where guys we, develop scar tissue around the urethra or somewhere right. where that obstructed the urine. Now they had urine retention. They were miserable. What's going on well, with that now? So what we learned is don't cook the urethra. <laughs> okay. That's simple. Don't, fr don't freeze it. Don't cook it. Don't radiate the heck out of it mm. because the urethra is very unforgiving. Mm. If you put a lot of energy on the urethra, it will react one out of three times with a severe scar. Mm. So- what does focal therapy do? It avoids the urethra with whatever technology, mm. right? And so if I've got to treat the urethra, I'm not doing focal therapy, mm. right? Mm. It's not appropriate, right? right? But the way you get to a low side effect profile is you select patients that you can treat the area without hitting critical structures. That's an intellectual process, right? Mm. That's mm. experience. That's someone knowing what the limits are of these different treatments. Um, but you're right. Nothing's Nothing's perfect, right? Can men have urinary retention? Can they have a catheter that has to go back in? Mm. Sometimes, yeah. Probably 10% of men 
will fail the first attempt if the catheter comes out. Catheter has to go in for another couple of days. Mm -hmm, okay. mm -hmm. Has anyone in my experience ever had long-term urinary retention? Not in the last 10 years. No, that's mm -hmm. not. Again, it's patient selection. Mm -hmm. Urine infections. Anytime we put a catheter and we know we can get a urinary infection, we got to monitor it carefully for that, right? So that's, but in terms of serious problems, I've yet in 20 years, I will tell you, I've never had a patient with a hole in their rectum. That's the most drear, dreaded complication, a rectal fistula. I've never had a patient with a rectal fistula. That's technique, hmm. right? That's meticulous technique and it's being very careful. But today that's a non-issue in the right hands. Mm -hmm. But ED, how good is your erection? Well, that, you know, that's, that's pretty subjective, right? And we argue today about what the right way to measure erectile function, but the shim, Most, the shim score is not good enough uh, anymore, no, Steve. You know, you know, it's it's as good as we've got. <laughs> yeah, right. But what it what it really goes down to, you're asking a patient, okay, to what percentage of time can you achieve an erection sufficient for penetration? Mm. Is it every time? Is it is it rarely? Is it 50-50? Is it 75-25? Mm. And that's the question we really look for on the shim score. Question two: mm. How 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 is your erection sufficient for penetration? And, you know, and that's the question we gauge, right? Now, do you do a treatment and some guy will say, hey, I, this is, this is so, this is, this is exactly like it was before. Well, sometimes it is, but oftentimes, you know, well, it's not quite as hard, not quite as long lasting, or I notice it just doesn't feel exactly the same. Yeah, that's common with any treatment, but that's not ED. That's, that's not common. Losing your that's erections. common with men after a certain age without any no, treatment, too. No, of course it is. You know, I think the one thing about incontinence is real. If we don't get near the urethra, yeah, I'm I'm very comfortable saying we're not going to have leakage. Interesting. Right? I mean, because because we're not getting near the control structures, we're not getting near the urethra. On the other hand, now say you've got a tumor that's close to the urethra and I've got to apply a treatment. There is more risk of some frequency to urinate, some urgency, some irritation, which could go on for a few weeks, right? Mm. Um, so again, nothing's perfect. But in the grand scheme of things, if I look and I say, okay, how does somebody going to do if we take the prostate out, if we use radiation, we use mm. CyberKnife, we use IMRT, we use whatever, versus a targeted therapy treating a small part of the prostate? Mm. I think it's very, I'm very comfortable saying your side effects are going to be the least they can possibly be comparing to everything else. And Dr. Mark Emerton, a good friend of ours, yeah. right from the University of College of London, mm. really showed very conclusively through his research that preserving prostate tissue helps to preserve prostate function. Hmm. That concept, I think, is accepted by all focal therapists today. So the more prostate tissue I can safely preserve, the closer to normal that man will be. Now, in fairness, is, is everyone, you know, is everyone going to be 100 percent normal? No, I don't think anyone gets there. Right. Hmm. Not a, there's no 100 percent in medicine. But if you've if you're if you've got this affliction of prostate cancer and you're fortunate enough to have a targeted treatment because you can get it where it's a focal therapy, I really do think the analogy of being a speed bump in your life is real, mm. as opposed to destroying your whole life. Yeah, um, and Steve, that's I, the ba it's the balance, right? That's the balance we got to look for. I got a good question. I got a question for you. Yeah, man comes in. He half one half of his prostate has a. Um, let's just call it a Gleason 8, and in a minute we can get into the, what's the highest Gleason score you can treat. We're going to get there, but that's not the question now. Half of the prostate Gleason 8. The other half, he has a Gleason 6. Do you treat the Gleason 8 and leave the Gleason 6 alone? You know, that is a wonderful question, and it's a leading question because that's all about shared decision-making. Mm. Okay? It's about educating the patient. It's not about what I want as a surgeon. It's about educating my patient and what he wants to do. Mm. Now, here's uh, my job is to bring the science, right? The science is that if we've got a very small, say we got one millimeter, two millimeters of Gleason grade six on one half of the prostate, and we've got an index lesion of whatever Gleason score on the other side, right? Seven, eight, doesn't matter. Mm. Do I think that the data suggests it's safe to leave the six alone? I think it is safe to leave the six alone. Mm. And I, and I think if, 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 if that man only had that small focus of Gleason 6 today, we'd be tempted. People like Scott Egner would say, you don't have a cancer. Mm. And I would agree with that, mm. right? Uh, if we're willing to watch that man and put him on surveillance, why would we want to treat that area, 
right? What's going to drive his risk is that that what we call that index tumor, that higher Gleason grade cancer elsewhere in the prostate. That's what drives his risk. Hmm. And so I, I think it's an intriguing idea. In fact, you know, it, it, that, that I think is something I will offer to a patient. Now, after it, that's finally up to that gentleman to decide, am I comfortable with surveillance for the good stuff? To, just do I have to, just to treat the bad area, right? Now, if, at my age, you know, and I'm I'm reached that I'm, I'm in that magic six O range now, you know, I would probably opt for that approach, mm. right? Mm. Um, is that right or wrong? I think that's a that's you know, my job is to educate our patient on the risks of that. The benefits of that, and they'll decide how aggressive yeah, or non-aggressive I, they want to be. But I, 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 yeah. I, but I think it's a reason. That's a very reasonable yeah. way to do it. That with Absolutely. aggressive, aggressive lifestyle intervention. First of all, anything with all these treatments with aggressive lifestyle interventions, I, I would, I would, in compliance with that, patients will do very well and likely would not have to worry about um, about their about their Gleason six. Yeah. Another no, question. So that the next question is, isn't a tumor a tumor? So if it's a Gleason 7, Gleason 8, Gleason 9, Gleason 10, why wouldn't we treat it with focal therapy? All, yeah, things, it, being, yeah. all things being equal, right? So yeah, we can see right. that there's nothing outside the gland. It's all encapsulated. There are no mutations associated. All things being equal, yeah. a tumor is no, a tumor. I, I, I think that's true, okay? Um, and, and if you apply temperature extreme, whether it's minus 60 centigrade, with cryo or plus 80 centigrade with HIFU, we're going to kill the target, right? Right. You're going to kill the target. Here's the, here's, and so here's where the risk is. And, and this goes back to our inaccuracy that we've had in staging. Okay. If we could know with good certainty that that Gleason eight or Gleason nine is truly small, confined to the prostate, has not spread, uh, and is contained, confined and targetable, then I think absolutely we can treat it with a targeted therapy. Mm. Now, until relatively recently, that was a guess. The higher the Gleason score is, the more likely there is that there's disease that's beyond the prostate, particularly in the lymph nodes. Even if you can't prove it. Even if you couldn't prove it, the more likely that is. Now, today, my practice, anyone's got four plus three or higher, we're going to get a PSMA PET CT scan for staging. Because I think before it was a coin flip with a CAT scan and a bone scan to suggest mm -hmm. if there's cancer out. That was a coin. It's 50-50. Yeah. And so the argument was we should treat you aggressively just in case there's more aggressive cancer beyond your prostate. Mm -hmm. Today, technology is there to get us to an, at least a 90% certainty level that the cancer is not spread. And PET scan has a sensitivity of about 92% for PSMA PET. So if I've got a tool Interesting, yeah. where I can understand that the cancer either is confined or it's not, I can make a better decision about whether I can confine treatment to just the prostate or whether we need to treat something more aggressively. Mm. So again, diagnostics, precision, personalized diagnostics, individualized diagnostics help to decide what's best for that individual man mm, mm. and and you know it's saying i'm always going to treat a gleason 8 or gleason 9 with treatment x y or z that's assembly line medicine right it sure is I, i'm so not an PS, advocate of yeah. psma is, uh, is is a game changer yeah and i think we're gonna i think we're gonna see even better assays but it, today it's a game changer it's yeah. a game changer today absolutely wow. so we do focal therapy how do we know that we're cancer free? Is PSA a good marker for recurrence at, at that point? They still have they still have a healthy glands, so it's still going to make PSA. Um, um, and it's follow uh, follow up biopsies. That is yep. that is that what you do, and how that's often? A, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, PSA is useful, but it's not. It's certainly not the only tool we're going to use. Mm. Okay, is it going to go down to zero? No, it will mm. never go to zero. And, mm. you know, the only way to get a zero is to have the prostate totally removed from the body. And then it doesn't always go to zero then. Yeah. But if I'm going to leave three quarters or a half or whatever percentage of the prostate, we're going to make PSA. Yeah. And over the first six months or so, the PSA levels are going to define what the new normal is, the new mm. normal baseline. 
And monitoring from that new normal becomes very important. Mm. So if someone, for example, went from a 10 to a two, mm. and by six months out, the PSA was two, and we stayed within a, a, the range of a two. And now, you know, that becomes a, that becomes a marker for non-recurrence, but it's not the only marker. Mm. MRI imaging is critically important. Mm. And so again, this goes back to how good is your MRI? Mm. If, and, and the problem that we have is MRIs done in different facilities. If they're not running this proper sequences, uh, it sometimes it's not very helpful. Mm. But a properly done MRI in experienced hands with an experienced reader uh, will identify um, probably um, you know 85 to 90 percent of all recurrences, not 100 percent. Mm. So there's going to be a role for biopsy, and where I use biopsy is in high-grade risky tumors. To Gleason start with eight, let's just say, or, a, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. If I have a Gleason eight and I get it at one year, I want to know the Gleason eight is gone. Despite what the MRI shows, despite yeah. what the PS, now, the PSA now rise. My, now my patient gets a vote there, right? And yeah. Shared decision making. Yeah. But my official recommendation is you've got a high risk tumor. I want to know it's dead. The only way for me to know it's certain is to biopsy you. Um, and, and he may say, no, my PSA isn't budging. The MRI looks great. I say, okay, but then we're going to do this again next year. We're going to do it next year. We're going to do this next year. I'm going to follow you like a hawk. Um, I think there is going to be a role. I'll go out on a limb here. I think there's going to be a role to using PSMA in these patients as mm, well. Yeah. It's not been validated yet, but I personally think that in the ablated patient, the treated patient, that ablation zone should have no tracer uptake whatsoever on PSMA, mm. and it's going to be a helpful tool. So although there's no absolute, I don't biopsy every man, but I biopsy men who in which I have clinical suspicion or I'm concerned about the an aggressive cancer to begin with. Mm. Let's say any of these focal therapies fail and they get a recurrence. Can they get a prostatectomy? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Yes, but most men don't want to. Okay. <laughs> or so, the, so, how about so, this? So, how about this as a question? Ahead. Who would do it? Yeah. Who, no, who would do the prostatectomy post uh, uh, focal therapy? You know, if I put names out there, they're going to probably kill me because that's not <laughs> the kind of patient anyone really wants to see. <laughs> right, right. But, but I will Let's tell just say you, very, very few surgeons are skilled enough, there, you think? There, 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 certainly are, there, is, there is certainly very skilled people around the country, several in New York City. Yeah. Uh, you know, certainly several, you know, on the West Coast, uh, people down here in Florida, really skilled. Uh, so a prostatectomy is absolutely feasible, although the one caveat is that the risk of erectile dysfunction in a post a second time treatment, a salvage treatment, a, although incontinence has been very easy, very well preserved, erectile function is hard to preserve with a post focal therapy prostatectomy. So I think that's true. Now, in my experience, if you have out of 10, say you had 10 men who had had a failed a focal therapy, right? Um, of that, of that 10, no more than one would want to have a prostatectomy. Mm. Fortunately, most don't have to have that. Mm. If the failure is out of field. So say we had a tumor well treated on the left side, but now something develops on the right side. Mm. That's really easy. That's virgin tissue. You can do whatever you want there. You can do focal. Any, any, other other fo any other focal therapy, any other focal therapy. If it's in the same side, depending on where it is and why it failed, you've got to go back and say, well, why did it fail? Did it fail because I was just too focal? I didn't mm. create a big enough treatment zone. Well, then you create a bigger treatment zone. You can mm. get, you can use another focal therapy, just create a larger zone. If it failed because you can't explain it, the tissue didn't respond well to energy, then you got to, you got to change horses. You got to pick a different weapon. Mm. Uh, so I think there's a lot of, the point though, is that having a focal therapy leads a very wide range of secondary treatment options. And it really closed the door on virtually none of them. Mm. And really, virtually none of them. Anything is feasible. And the big advantage of focal therapy is that is that it doesn't limit the ability to add more treatment, you know, in the future, whatever that treatment may be. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in my experience, at least half of the people who start with focal therapy, if they can have another focal therapy, they want to do that. They want to do that. They did so well. Um, so, but it's very flexible. And that's one of the big advantages, I think, of the approach is that 
you really do get a do-over in, in, in select cases and depending on what a patient wants. Great. Steve, uh, we, we, uh, that's it for me, man. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, you know, that was, that was, that was, uh, I think that's a master class in, well, I, I would say for, for an overview on focal therapy, one hour, that's a master class in, in focal therapy for prostate cancer. So I, I really appreciate it. Well, you know, I'm driven by how our patients do, honestly, hmm. they're my biggest cheerleaders. The guys come back and after seeing a guy 10, 15 years out, it comes back and he gives you a hug. That means a lot. That's what it's all about. That means a lot. Absolutely. That, that, that means a lot. Steve, how can patients find you? And we're going to add uh, those links to our show notes. Yeah, the easiest way to get me is through our website. Really mm -hmm. easy. CiantiProstateCenter.com. All right. Cianti, CiantiProstateCenter.com. Um, you know, a lot of videos there, a lot of research data there, a big informational <sighs> library there. So good place to get an education good way to reach out to us. You know, here's the pledge I make to every patient. If you take the time to contact our office and send us information, we will get back to you. My staff will personally get all that information in front of me. I will personally review it mm. and we'll let you know whether you're a candidate or not. Mm. Perfect. Steve, thank you so much, my brother, for um, joining me today. And I know you had a, a every day is a busy clinic day for you and for you to have agreed to do this and um and get it done i really appreciate it i think it's gonna be very helpful for a lot of listeners out there geo you listen you're changing the world my friend and we <laughs> just uh, you keep keep up the battle <laughs> all right man thanks so much and uh i'll talk to you next time thank you thank you all have all a right, great day thank you thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the dr geo podcast you can watch all episodes of this podcast and much more by subscribing to my YouTube channel on youtube.com forward slash Gio Espinoza ND. If you love what you heard today, you can help by leaving a five-star review of the podcast on Apple and Spotify as each review helps us reach more men who are serious about improving their urological health and how to function better with age. And for the latest research and actionable takeaways in the world of men's health and integrative urology, sign up for my newsletter at drgeo.com. I'll see you next time.